All right, let's get warmed up for Farm Basics 12. First question, what's the clinical use for teotropium? So teotropium is an inhaled anticholinergic drug that's used to treat COPD. It helps relax the airways and it reduces bronchospasms. If you remember, teotropium is like atropine. Next, what enzyme catalyzes the conversion of tyrosine to DOPA? The enzyme is tyrosine hydroxylase. And the last one, what are the three different G proteins and what are their downstream effects? So there's GQ, which activates phospholipase C, and then phospholipase C splits PIP2 into IP3 and DAG, or diacylglycerol. And then IP3 increases intracellular calcium, and DAG activates protein kinase C. Another G protein we talked about was GS, and S is for stimulate. So GS stimulates adenyl cyclase, and then adenyl cyclase converts ATP into cyclic AMP, and that activates protein kinase A. And the third one is the GI receptor, which inhibits adenyl cyclase and decreases cyclic AMP production and decreases protein kinase A activity. Then which receptors use each of these G proteins? So GQ, uh, remember that's used by the HAV1 M&M &M receptors. So H1, alpha-1, V1, M1, and M3. GI is used by the MAD2s. So that's M2, alpha-2, and D2. And then all the other receptors we talked about use GS. So that's beta-1 and beta-2, D1, H2, and V2. All right. Let's get to the lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our step one video on antidotes. Here's a true story. One time in residency, I had a very difficult patient. As I was examining him, I would ask him various questions about his medical history, but he simply refused to answer any of my questions. Nothing I said could elicit a response. I came to the conclusion that he was suffering from some sort of cognitive dysfunction. He couldn't understand even simple questions. I sat him down, and I tried to use very simple language to explain to him my findings and that I would probably need to send him to a neurologist to be evaluated. He then called me an idiot and told me that he was deaf. So the moral of the story is that it's challenging to break bad news to a patient. All right, so moving on. So this video is all about antidotes. We're going to cover a long list of these and then we'll basically review the entire lecture in the end of session quiz. And just like in our previous video, I'll go through some clinical scenarios that might show up on your test later on. So you'll also notice that we're talking about antidotes here, which doesn't always mean the same thing as treatment. Sometimes you'll see a patient intoxicated or overdosed on a specific drug or toxin, and though an antidote exists, the treatment might actually be more on the supportive side. So let's get started here. First, a clinical vignette that we have here. A 27-year-old man presents to the emergency room with tachycardia, dilated pupils, agitation, and poor dental hygiene. This description maybe is a bit nonspecific, but this could easily be a patient who has overdosed on methamphetamine. People who chronically use meth will often get what's called meth mouth. They lose their teeth due to a xerostomia, so poor oral hygiene as well, and then a lot of carbonated beverages and bruxisms, so that grinding of teeth. So if you see a busted up mouth on a test question, then always think of meth. So what's the antidote? Well, you give what's called ammonium chloride, which will act to acidify the urine, which will help clearance. Now, most of the time, we treat uh, the symptoms, though, with benzodiazepines, antipsychotics, and maybe uh, antihypertensives. That's going to decrease that elevated BP that you often get with methamphetamines. Let's move on to acetaminophen. So this is found in nearly every house, uh, household. So what's the toxic dose? Well, this can vary a little bit. At least 12 grams or 12,000 milligrams in a 24-hour period is considered the toxic dose when you start seeing lots of uh, medical problems. Uh, and the recommended maximal dose, though, is less than that, 4 grams in a 24-hour period. So always remember that people shouldn't take more than 4,000 milligrams in a 24-hour period. Now, the antidote for this is called N-acetylcysteine. So why does it work? Well, when the body receives too much acetaminophen, uh, a toxic metabolite is produced called N-acetyl-p-benzoquinone uh, amine. So that's a big long thing. That's why we call it NAPQI. So too much NAPQI uh, will damage hepatocytes. Now, usually this metabolite is conjugated by glutathione. So this is where it works here. N-acetylcysteine uh, works by replenishing the glutathione. Let's move on to salicylate. So this is things like aspirin. These patients are going to have nausea, vomiting, uh, dizziness, and tinnitus. Remember, the tinnitus is a great clue on a, on a test question uh, that a patient has taken too much aspirin. Now, if you were to have a toxic overdose, uh, what would you give in this situation? Well, you would probably give something like sodium bicarb. You're going to alkalinize the urine in these situations, but you could also do things like dialysis. So if you get a really high dose, you might want to use dialysis. 
Next, we have acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, or sometimes uh, we refer to these as organophosphates. Now, how would you treat that overdose? Now, remember, this is that drooling farmer scenario. Uh, so the answer to the antidote part is pralidoxine. Uh, so how does that work? Well, it's going to regenerate the acetylcholinesterases. And then uh, to immediately help the symptoms, though, you would give atropine. So atropine is an anticholinergic, and it's probably used more often than the pralidoxine. Now, if you had too much uh, anticholinergic effect, speaking of uh, atropine, uh, what is the antidote, antidote for that? So this is where you're going to have a patient that's going to be dry as a bone, blind as a bat, bloated as a toad, those type of things. And the antidote would be physostigmine. So remember, we give physostigmine to fix an atropine overdose. What about beta blockers? And also we're talking about verapamil as well. So beta blockers and verapamil, how would you treat an overdose of those two types of medications? Well, you would expect to see things like bradycardia in these patients. Well, glucagon is a classic answer to this question, which never really made much sense to me. The uh, suspected mechanism is that uh, glucagon uh, increases CAMP, uh, and in the uh, myocardium specifically, which will then bypass the beta adrenergic second messenger system. Atropine is another treatment, which makes a lot more sense to me because it increases heart rate. And then calcium can also be used, which could help in uh, contractility and myocardium conduction as well. So I want you to know those three things for beta blocker and non-dihydropyridine uh, calcium channel blocker overdoses, uh, things like verapamil overdose. Remember glucagon, remember calcium, and atropine. They can all be used to help raise that heart rate back up. Next, we're talking about digitalis or digoxin. So arrhythmia is the most dangerous manifestation of digitalis uh, overdose. And as with mi uh, any arrhythmia, you definitely want to make sure that the potassium and the magnesium are optimized. So you might have to treat that. If it's a severe overdose, then you give what's called anti-dig fragments. But you really won't see this done very often. Most of the time, supportive care is all that is needed. Uh, things like atropine, again, can be used for significant bradycardia. Okay guys, it's time for another one of those clinical vignettes. This one here is a three-year-old patient uh, presenting with two hours of abdominal pain, hematemesis, melana, and lethargy. Now the patient is suspected of eating a bottle of vitamins. So this is uh, acute gastrointestinal phase of iron poisoning. So iron poisoning uh, can vary quite uh, dramatically and it can be so severe that it can actually lead to death. Uh, but that's not the only way to get an iron overload. Patients uh, that receive frequent transfusions can also get that uh, uh, too much iron scenario as well. So patients that have beta thalassemia or sickle cell disease, they might be getting too much iron from those multiple transfusions. So what's the antidote? Well, the uh, chelating agent here is uh, what's called deferoxamine. So deferoxamine is what you need to remember. Sometimes you can use the FE and furoxamine, deferoxamine, to help you remember uh, that you're treating an iron overdose with it. Let's move on to lead poisoning. This is actually pretty difficult to uh, catch on a question as well. Children may see uh, very mild things like developmental delays. There might be some nonspecific GI symptoms, so it's not always real obvious that it's a lead toxicity. But if you do have severe uh, lead intoxication or toxicity, uh, children should receive dimercaparol and calcium disodium uh, edentate. Sometimes we just refer to this as calcium EDTA. Uh, for less severe intoxications, uh, patients can be given something called succimer. Penicillamine is a third-line agent, and it's only used when the other drugs aren't tolerated. Now, this is a little bit different in adults. In adults, we tend to use more of the succimer and the calcium EDTA uh, as first line. All right, how about for some of our metals here? Mercury, arsenic, and gold. Uh, you can use a dimercaparol or succimer. Those can be used. And there's a nice little uh, hint for dimercaparol. If you think about gold as being a monetary unit, then the dime uh, is a monetary unit. Uh, and then dimercaparol, that kind of goes along with that. And then there's the four-letter arrangement Merc for mercury and mercury and also dimercaparol. Uh, so that's a good way of having dimercaparol kind of remind you uh, of mercury and gold and that sort of thing. What about uh, copper, arsenic, and gold as well? Uh, so you can use penicillamine. So think about copper pennies. Uh, so for copper overload, uh, you would use penicillamine. So who gets copper overloaded? Uh, so remember, those are patients with Wilson's disease. So you can't uh, forget those Kaiser Fleischer rings. What about cyanide toxicity? So who gets cyanide toxicity? Well, if you've ever been in a house fire, you might get it. Or if you have an excess of sodium nitroprusside, if you're given that in, in the hospital. So sodium nitroprusside can actually lead to that cyanide toxicity. Now, how do we treat cyanide toxicity? Well, you can use nitrites, you can do uh, hydroxycobalamin, uh, and you can also use thiosulfate. So that's the big one for those. What about methemoglobin? So methemoglobinemia, you're going to treat this with methylene blue. So that's pretty easy, the meth, methylene blue. Uh, actually, vitamin C is also helpful in that situation as well. Moving on, a 53-year-old homeless man presents with confusion, headache, vertigo, and flu-like symptoms. On exam, he has very red-appearing lips. 
Uh, not many things can actually cause that uh, red appearing, or sometimes we refer to as cherry red lips. And this is going to be carbon monoxide poisoning. So how did this homeless man get carbon monoxide poisoning? Well, we often think of house fires or car exhaust, uh, but don't forget about kerosene lamps, heaters, or stoves. So maybe uh, patients, uh, especially if they're trying to keep warm, that might be sitting very close to a kerosene heater. Um, so that can be a uh, presentation there. Now, how do we treat this? Well, you want to actually uh, give them 100% oxygen. So that's actually a relatively simple antidote. Uh, you can try to displace the carbon monoxide off of the hemoglobin. Now, if it's available, you can also use hyperbaric oxygen if you have those available at your hospital. All right, next we're moving on to methanol and ethylene glycol. So a lot of this is found in things like antifreeze. It has a very sweet taste, so children may drink this if they get juice, so you always want to keep your antifreeze away from kids. The answer is fomepazole. That's going to be your drug of choice for antidote. So how does it work? Well, it's actually going to inhibit alcohol dehydrogenase. Uh, if you don't have fomepazole, then you can uh, either use ethanol, uh, and that ethanol can compete uh, for that active site. Uh, so back in the olden days, um, people who were alcoholics would come in and say, hey, I just drank a bunch of antifreeze. I guess I'm going to die unless you give me a bunch of ethanol. Um, so people were kind of forced in the ER to give them a bunch of ethanol through their IV to uh, keep them from uh, living. So it's nice that we have fomepazole now. All right, moving on. Now we have opioid overdose. So you're going to treat this with naloxone or naltrexone. Now one classic scenario uh, that you might use this, maybe outside of the ER when people come in overdose, uh, is that maybe potentially in labor and delivery. So if a mom that received maybe an opioid for labor pain then delivers a baby maybe a little quick, more quickly than they thought they would, and then that baby has too much opioids on board, so too much in their system. So potentially you have to give a baby one of these two drugs to help bring them out of that, uh, that coma state. Next, let's move on to benzodiazepine overdose. We've covered this in some other lectures as well. What are you going to treat that with? That's going to be flumazenil. But you've got to be really careful with people who chronically use benzodiazepines. Uh, if they come in, you give them a lot of flumazenil, you might go through withdrawal symptoms and maybe even give themselves uh, a seizure by doing that. Next, we have TCA overdose. Uh, sodium bicarb is your treatment of choice, uh, just like we saw with sil uh, salicylate overdoses. Next, we have heparin overdose, and we're going to treat this with protamine. And so I think about uh, uh, this as the H in heparin. I think of that as being maybe an H plus molecule or a proton. And so you can use protamine to treat uh, that proton. Uh, so this is a heparin overdose. I know it's a little loose association, but we can use anything we can to, to remember this stuff. Next, we have warfarin overdose. The answer is vitamin K. So warfarin works by inhibiting the vitamin K clotting factors. But what if you need to reverse the anticoagulation quickly? Will vitamin K do that? Well, vitamin K actually works very slowly, even over days. So to quickly reverse warfarin, you're going to have to give fresh frozen plasma. FFP has all those clotting factors still in it, so it's not going to inhibit that sort of thing. So it's going to take three to five days for those clotting factors to come back with vitamin K. Next, we have TPA, streptokinase, urokinase. Uh, here, so if you are over uh, anticoagulating someone uh, in an acute situation, the antidote here is going to be aminocaproic acid. And next we have theophylline. Typically, uh, that's going to uh, cause an overdose uh, that's going to show up uh, with a lot of tachycardia and maybe some arrhythmias. Uh, and so theophylline uh, causing that tachycardia, and we're usually using that with our uh, bad asthma patients or maybe bad COPD patients. And the antidote here is going to be a beta blocker because you're trying to counteract that tachycardia. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of the list here. Now it's time for that end of session quiz. Let's go over through uh, all these answers together. Okay, as I said before, we're basically reviewing the entire lecture in this one question. So let's go through this. So what are the antidotes to the following toxins? So first we have acetaminophen. What, which one was that? Remember, it was N-acetylcysteine. Salicylate, so this is going to be aspirin. Remember, aspirin is a weak acid, so to trap an acid in the urine, you're going to need alkalinizing uh, of the urine, so we give sodium bicarb to alkalinize that urine. Next, we have amphetamine. So these are weak bases, so you're going to acidify the urine with ammonium chloride. Next, we have the anticholinesterases or uh, organophosphates. The reversal agent, uh, the two things you're going to remember are atropine and pralidoxine. Anti-muscarinic, anti-cholinergic agents, remember your prototype anti-muscarinic is atropine, so we fix atropine overdoses with physostigmine. For digoxins, uh, there's multiple things. You've got to stop the dig, of course. You want to make sure you're normalizing your potassium and your magnesium. If there's bradycardia, then you can give things like atropine. You might even have to do some cardiac pacing if you had to. Uh, but if there are lots of serious things going on, then you might have to use the anti-dig antibody fragments. Next, we have iron. So this is the treatment uh, for uh, uh, iron toxicity. It's going to be deferoxamine. Remember, you've got to remember that uh, chemical symbol for iron is Fe, so ferroxamine is how you remember that. 
Lead, the antidote would be EDTA or succimer or dimercaparol. Arsenic, mercury, and gold, you can use dimercaparol or succimer again. Remember that dimercaparol, you can think of the merc for mercury and also remember uh, the dime for any type of gold or monetary unit and that sort of thing. Moving on to the copper, arsenic, and gold, penicillamine. Remember, pennies are made of copper, so we treat toxicity with penicillamine. Uh, so you can also remember that. Next, we have cyanide toxicity. Uh, so to treat it, you're going to give nitrites. You can also get hydroxycobalamin, or you can give thiosulfate. Methemoglobinemia, that's going to be uh, a reversal agent using methylene blue. That's pretty easy, methylene, uh, methemoglobin. And then vitamin C can also be helpful as well. Carbon monoxide, so carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin, competes for oxygen on that binding site you're going to treat with 100% oxygen or maybe hyperbaric oxygen. Next, we have methanol or ethylene glycol, uh, which is found in antifreeze. You have a few options here. You can give them uh, ethanol if it's the good old days, uh, or you can give uh, maybe just hemodialysis. Uh, but your drug of choice here, the one you got to remember is fomepazole. Next, we have opioids. The reversal agent there is either naloxone or naltrexone. Antidote for benzodiazepines is flumazenil. Be careful you don't give someone a seizure. Tricyclic antidepressants, you're going to alkalinize the urine uh, with sodium bicarb. It helps get rid of those. For heparin, remember use that H term. Think of protamine as the reversal agent. Warfarin interferes with those li the liver's ability to make those vitamin K dependent coagulation factors. So the reversal agent is just vitamin K. But it's going to take a few days for those factors to come back. Uh, so vitamin K, again, isn't the fast acting one. If you have to immediately reverse warfarin, then you have to give fresh frozen plasma to replace those coagulation factors. TPA and streptokinase, the reversal agent is aminocaproic acid. And then theophylline, remember theophylline, uh, poor therapeutic index, uh, very cardiotoxic, so you gotta, gotta use a lot of beta blockers uh, to help with that tachycardia. All right guys, that brings us to the end of Farm 12. I hope you learned something. I'll see you next time. What is the antidote for mercury poisoning? Dimercaprol. What is the antidote for carbon monoxide poisoning? It's 100% oxygen. What's the antidote for organophosphate poisoning? Pralidoxime. And it's obvious to me that there is no antidote for your particular brand of stupidity. No amount of screaming, shouting, insults, abuse, or infantile tantrums on my part seems to have any effect at all on overcoming your utter incompetence. This is it. I'm done. Goodbye and good luck. You're gonna need it.